Welcome to Epicenter, the show which talks about the technologies, projects and people driving decentralization in the blockchain re revolution. I'm Friederike Ernst. Today we're speaking with Gabriel Chipton and Stella Magnin, who are involved in the um, Assange uh, DAO. And uh, before we talk uh, with them, let me talk about our sponsors today. Are your crypto assets sitting idle in your wallet? Start earning rewards and contribute to network security by staking with Chorus One, a staking provider securing 5 billion in assets on over 25 decentralized networks, including Solana, Cosmos, and Ethereum. Chorus One recently airdropped over 3,600 exclusive NFTs to its Solana delegators, according to their delegation profile in December 2021. The NFTs are also available on the secondary market on platforms like Magic Eden. If you missed out on this airdrop, don't worry, you can still participate in the upcoming airdrops for Cosmos chains by simply delegating to Chorus One nodes. And are you interested in running your own branded node? The managed white label node as a service offering leverages Chorus One's highly available and proven infrastructure in um, enabling you to participate directly in decentralized networks. Head over to Chorus.One to start your staking journey. Our other sponsor is Paraswap, and Paraswap is a DEX aggregator on Ethereum. You can get the best market price as they have the fastest and cheapest liquidity. They just la launched their version 5, which has a new contract and new APIs and is pretty gas friendly. And they recently added support for Avalanche, Polygon and BSC, um, as well as Phantom. You can use Paraswap directly from your Ledger and Ledger Live. In addition to that, they are also becoming a DAO. So if you have the PSP tokens, that's something you can participate in. Go check it out at paraswap.io. Gabriel and Stella, um, thank you so much for coming on. Um, we're here to talk about um, the Assange court case and um, uh, the WikiLeaks backstory and um, the Assange DAO today. Um, but briefly, could you two introduce yourselves? Let's see. I have been in the DAO ecosystem since about 2017, contributed to projects like Moloch DAO, Giveth, Bright ID, and Aragon. And uh, I've also been a product manager and UX designer since about 2008. Um, that's like a brief introduction. Um, one of my main projects right now is called Black Sky Network. And don't really need to talk about that that much right now because that's not the focus of this podcast. And uh, I'm Gabriel Shipton. I'm a film producer and Julian Assange's brother. I've been advocating uh, for Julian uh, publicly for about three years now, um, you know, across, across the world, in the US and uh, Europe, as well as Australia. Cool. Thank you guys for coming on. So let's talk about the backstory to um, the Assange um, trial and the entire DAO coming into um, existence um, first, so um, Julian um, founded WikiLeaks, um, a platform where whistleblowers uh, could anonymously drop information. What was the service that WikiLeaks provided? Um, because in principle, I mean, did they fact check? Did they publicize, or how did they how did they serve the whistleblowers? Yeah, well, uh, WikiLeaks they so they used I guess cryptography and Tor to go and combine those together to make the you know anonymous Dropbox. Uh, so that um, you know, these mass leaks uh, could be, you know, submitted anon anonymously. Then they would, um, you know, use their network to check the, you know, check to verify uh, the leaks, and then they would uh, publish them. Uh, they started in 2006, and you know they've got a perfect record. So uh, they became 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 a magnet for leakers. Basically, because it's uh, it's very difficult to actually stay anonymous, right? So basically, when, when you intend to um, publicize large amounts of data, staying anonymous is, is a major concern. So basically, they kind of inserted themselves as a buffer? Yes, and they were censorship, you know, they were totally censorship resistant as well. So, um, you know, their, their, their legal setup allowed them to uh, carry on, you know, keep, keep their servers up and carry on publishing uh, under, under any circumstance, basically. Did they also fact check, or did they did, did they self censor some of the information that was select uh, that that was transmitted to them? Uh, I I don't think so, no. But and they did fact check, yeah. So they like I said, they've got this perfect they've got this perfect record where um, nothing has been uh, proved to be fake, or, or or any of the documents have found to be fake. Uh, so yeah, they were fact checking and making sure that everything was um, everything that they published 
on on the WikiLeaks website was uh, you know true to that source, and yeah, it was original source documents that that were published. Okay, and um, so Julian started this um, this undertaking. Obviously, there were lots of other people um, involved. Um, ca can you? Briefly talk about um, the sort of leaks that um, brought Julian into the crosshairs of law enforcement. Yeah, well, I guess I can talk about it maybe from a uh, my personal perspective. So when you know WikiLeaks started, um, you know we sort of uh, I looked watched it grow curiously. You know they had um, things about the Church of Scientology, different sort of leaks like that originally, uh, and so you know it was interesting and 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 you know watching it form. Uh, but the first time that uh, the first time that I uh, became, you know, really saw the power of WikiLeaks was uh, when um, Julian published uh, some documents from Kenya, a report in Kenya uh, that led to a led to a change uh, of government, and that's that was the first time when, um, you know, we, we when I started hearing that you know some people who Julian. Uh, had worked with, you know, were, were turned up dead and things like that. So that that was the first time that really, you know, this is something that uh, is confronting power, is making power, the power structures afraid, uh, so afraid that they will, you know, act out and, and do something. So that that is the first time you know, around that time when, when WikiLeaks sort of, uh, you know, confronted that sort of resistance, I think. So, I mean, there's different sorts of resistance, right? So basically there's um, resistance from what we would see as illegitimate actors and then there's resistance from legitimate actors or people we think ought to be legitimate actors, so basically Western democratic governments. I mean, if if you're in the crosshairs um, for something where the democratic record is less than stellar, um, that that's um, that's maybe not completely surprising. Um, but but Julian actually also made it into the crosshairs of the American administration um, through the the um, uh, the leak um, from Chelsea Manning, Manning yeah, right? That's right. So the Afghan war diaries, the the Afghan war diaries, the Iraq war logs, uh, the cable set uh, of diplomatic cables, um, and also the Guantanamo Bay detainee files. So since it was basically yeah after after that was published um you know months later it, that's when all these uh, attacks started on julian you know the uh, allegations in sweden uh, he was trapped in the uk so uh, shortly after that uh, publishing those leaks is uh, when you know the, these larger forces or um you know what we could you know i guess i don't really consider them to be uh, you know law abiding governments but most people do uh, that's when they started really ramping up their attacks on Julian and, and you know, limiting his freedom. So he was invited to the UK by the Guardian and and he's been trapped there ever since, you know, like, uh, so he left Sweden um, and he was invited to the UK and uh, that's when he was, uh, an Interpol red notice was issued and he was um, arrested and, yeah, he's, he's been stuck in England ever since. Now he's in prison uh, just outside of London. Why do you think it was only Julian? Because, I mean, basically there's a number of people involved with WikiLeaks, right? Yes, that's right. I think, you know, in the beginning, Julian, um, you know, he was, he he became the lightning rod for, to sort of protect the other people. So, uh, you know, in the beginning it was uh, a bit of that, um, but then, you know, as his profile grew and grew, then uh, you know he be he he was he became the lightning rod. I mean, you know, to, for for these sort of um, regulatory attacks that have been coming at him uh, for the past eleven years. But there are the other people in WikiLeaks. The other uh, WikiLeaks people have been investigated, um, spied on by the CIA. Uh, you know, Andy Muller Magan. Uh, there was confirmed that he was spied on uh, by the CIA. That was uh, confirmed by thirty sources from within the CIA. Uh, last September, in a, in a Yahoo News investigation, so uh, it's not just Julian, but he is the most prominent prominent one that is, um, you know, suffering at the moment. So, what are the charges that are being levied against him? 
Well, he's, I mean, he's charged under the... I mean, you know, basically he's charged for publishing um, these Chelsea Manning leaks. That's that's what he's been charged with. Uh, it's this... Uh, he's charged under the Espionage Act. Um, but if you if you look at the... If you look at the indictment, it's it's it just sort of outlines, well, you know, he received these leaks and he published them and therefore that's illegal. So uh, he's charged uh, 17 counts of the Espionage Act, which carry 170 years in prison and one charge under uh, computer intrusion, which carries five years. So a total of 175 years uh, maximum sentence. Um, the It was brought under the Trump administration so this indictment was uh, Obama the Obama administration looked into the into charging uh, Julian and they found that they could not charge Julian without uh, charging the New York Times as well without in that and they called that the New York Times problem so they uh, put the indictment aside and then uh, when Trump came in in 2017 uh, and it was just after uh, Julian leaked the Vault 7 or published the Vault 7 leaks, which were the CIA hacking tools. And that's when Mike Pompeo made this speech and he called uh, WikiLeaks a non-state hostile intelligence service. So what everyone sort of scratched their heads at the time and, and it was his first speech as the CIA director. So it was, um, he, he focused on WikiLeaks and he's, you know, that's a really, you know, big thing. And Everyone scratched their head at the time, saying, "Like, what does this mean? What is a non-state hostile intelligence uh, service? So that that's like a new a new a word." And what it actually meant is that the CIA could uh, use the same techniques and tools that they use against, say, uh, you know, Iranian secret service or or the Russian the FSB or something like that. They could then uh, use those on WikiLeaks. Uh, without getting congressional approval, without um, taking it to those sort of checks and balances level. So it was uh, from that moment onwards that uh, that things really, that, the, the, you know, Julian's uh, persecution really ramped up. There was a time inside the Ecuadorian embassy where the Ecuadorian government changed and a security as the security company that was hired to protect Julian uh, became a CIA asset. And uh, they started ramping up uh, surveillance inside the embassy. Uh, they installed cameras that had listening devices on them. Uh, they would start taking... I remember I went there, they take your passport, they take your phone, they open your phone, they take pictures of your IMA and everything like that. They take pictures of your passport. And then when you leave, they give it back to you. Uh, and at that time, Julian had a jammer. So we'd, we'd go in and he would put on like a you know, a static jammer when we when we spoke because he knew there were microphones there uh, recording because of this hostile environment. Uh, they we, Then later on, there was um, some... This was all sort of exposed in a Spanish court case because some people from the security company uh, leaked out that uh, these things were, hap were going on and that the plans were actually worse. They were uh, agents who were stealing Julian's uh, children's nappies uh, to find their DNA... Uh, just to sort of prove that he was the father, uh, they found out that there were plots to poison Julian and that there were plots to kidnap Julian from the embassy. And so then uh, last September, there was this investigation uh, by Yahoo News, by these three reporters, and the, all these claims were confirmed by these 30 sources from inside the intelligence community. Uh, they were confirmed that there were plots within the CIA to murder Julian, uh, plots to kidnap him. And in fact, the plots to kidnap him became before the indictment. So uh, the CIA went to the White House uh, with this plot to kidnap Julian and the DOJ said, well, what are you going to do with him? Like, you're going to kidnap him. We can't put him in Guantanamo. Like, what are you going to do when he, what are you going to do with him when you get here? Let us do the indictment first and then we can get him out. And so that's what kicked off this, uh, this current indictment and that was back in 2017 and, uh, you know, that's when we saw things ramp up in the embassy and the plan to get Julian out of the embassy really uh, ramped up. And there was this, it's a, uh, it's actually, a, it's called, uh, what's the code name? It's like a Pelican, I think, something Pelican. It was actually um, a code codenamed um, operation by, uh, by the British, uh, British intelligence um, to get Julian out of the embassy and... Uh, along with the Ecuadorians. So the, the British government uh, conspired with the Ecuadorian government to 
uh, eject uh, Julian out of the Ecuadorian embassy. So it's almost like a, you know, they came up with this plot to kidnap him, but they turned it into a, a judicial kidnapping. And that's what we're seeing now. Julian's still, uh, you know, being held hostage, basically, uh, in Belmarsh prison. And, uh, yeah, that's the, that's the sort of story of how he's gotten there uh, at the moment. Why, why are the things that he did not covered um, by uh, the First Amendment rights? I mean, so basically free speech and freedom of the press is something that the US have historically held up really high. Yeah, that, that's true. And I think, it, you know, I think there's a lot of, you know, resistance to the case actually going to the US because it would really test this out and it would be very publicly unpopular uh, to have this, you know, the prosecution of a publisher in a, in a court in the US. So uh, what's what what's happening at the moment, it's like this continuation of this judicial kidnapping is that there is a very, very weak extradition agreement that was put in place in the UK after after 9-11 uh, so that they, you know, the, the idea being, you know, we can come in and just grab whoever we want and, and take take terrorists and, and try them in the US. Uh, so that uh, weak extradition agreement has been exploited by the DOJ uh, in order to keep Julian uh, in prison in the UK. Uh, and one thing about the UK, it's its journalism laws aren't, aren't uh, as strong as the US. Uh, and I think, you know, after, you know, we've seen, you know, after the Snowden leaks, you know, uh, uh, MI6 agents going into the Guardian and smashing up computers. Um, they have the D-notice uh, board where that, that, uh, it's basically the intelligence community sits down with all the editors of the newspapers and says, you know, you, they work out what to publish. So uh, the UK press is, is the press rights are, are non-existent, basically. So uh, that's, that's why he's sort of been kept there through these, uh, through these extradition laws and, and just sort of letting it run on. Because every, you know, the, the idea is to keep him in prison, to show everybody that uh, if, if you publish this information, this is what's going to happen to you. We'll move you from place to place and we'll exploit these laws and we'll exploit the court systems uh, to keep you in prison, to keep you uh, locked up until you either die, uh, you know, it, but yeah, until you die, <laughs> except that's it. Oh, that's pretty dire. So wh why do you think the Trump administration at the time kind of, wh why do you think um, they made this, distinction between bringing charges against Julian and WikiLeaks and the New York Times? Is it because um, bringing charges against the New York Times would not carry popular support? Uh, and basically they can do, they can kind of paint Julian and WikiLeaks as um, this broke organization? Yes. So there's a, you know, a, a 10 year long propaganda campaign to sort of destroy Julian and WikiLeaks as reputation. And so what that created was a political situation in the U.S. where uh, it was, um, you know, it was it was okay. People thought, oh, this person is, you know, this person, uh, say, one of the one of the um, one of the ones that's most worrying at the moment and, and and stops a lot of people from supporting Julian is that they think he he got Trump elected. So this narrative is pushed into the into the Democratic Party and into the Democratic voters that Julian got Trump elected, Julian got Trump elected. And so uh, they believe, you know, well, he's our political opponent. So we don't actually mind if he's uh, if he's been uh, you know, if his rights are abused, you know, it's convenient to us, it's convenient to our uh, political situation. So I think that's that's this sort of uh, you know this these narratives that are created in order for this uh, to happen and but and so he, Julian's political Julian's constituency has been taken away from him by all these media this propaganda campaign uh, over the years and um, whereas the New York Times they are you know aligned with the Democratic Party so they have the the protection of the Democratic Party you know when it comes to that those sort of stuff so you see things like um, you know, requests for uh, access to reporters' emails that came under the Trump DOJ. Uh, you see, when 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 it changes to the Biden DOJ, uh, Merrick Garland, the current DOJ, goes in and says, "Oh, we're not going to do that anymore." You know, because we're we're the Democrats now. We're going to go after Project Veritas, which is a right wing uh, newspaper. So it's 
you know, as long as you've got one side, uh, you're okay. But if you're actually, you know, if you want to communicate the truth to everybody without a political allegiance, uh, then you're in a very difficult uh, position because when they come after you, uh, you know, be, you're, uh, you, you're vulnerable to attack from e each side. I mean, it's also the core of civil liberties that everyone is allowed them, right? So basically you can't just go after the people who say things um, that you don't agree with. Let, let's talk about um, the administration change. So, I mean, obviously, um, the charges were first brought by the Trump administration, and now it's the Biden administration. So, does this does this change things? Because, as you said earlier, the Obama administration had decided that the charges were too weak to bring. So, sh shouldn't that kind of inform what's happening now? Yeah, I mean, that's what you would expect. Um, You know, like we went to the US last January to try and lobby the incoming administration um, because we sort of, yeah, we, 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 you know, had some hope that, you know, when they came in that they would uh, wind this, um, wind this back. But uh, they, there was some promising signs, like I said, like they've, uh, uh, they withdrew those um, subpoenas for the New York Times journalists uh, emails and things like that. They even amended the, um, com uh, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act as well, so that uh, you know what they had charged with uh, what they had charged Aaron Schwartz with was potentially uh, now not possible. Uh, so there were some promising signs uh, from the administration, but uh, not uh, on Julian's case. So it, it, they sort of have doubled down on it now, and and they're pushing it. Uh, they're pushing it forward. You know, they're appealing to the highest level. Uh, you know, they appeal to the high court where they won and the extradition was ordered. And now Julian's uh, just submitted his application to appeal to the Supreme Court. He has submitted that on the 7th, uh, which is when the uh, NFT auction was launched. So that is the sort of next step in the Supreme Court. But I don't, you know, there are some, uh, you know, the Biden administration, I don't really... Um, think that they, they're going to do, do anything without any sort of major political cost. You know, there, there has to be a, a, you know, sort of, there has to be some political pressure on them uh, for them to, to drop this case. So basically looking at last year, I mean, there were extradition proceedings in the UK. Um, and then basically in, the, in January, um, the judge ruled that um, Assange could not be extradited to the United States because of concerns about um, mental health and risk of suicide in, in a U.S. prison. Um, and then basically the U.S. appeared. I mean, that's a very active act, right? So basically this is something that where, where basically if you're handed, if you're handed a court case um, and you don't really agree with it in the first place and then you, then you lose, um, um, th then basically deciding to appear This is very active. I mean, they could have decided to not appear this. I mean, it would have been an easy way out, right? So basically, if you don't really agree with the case. Yeah, but I don't. I think you know they're scared of Julian. They're they're afraid of, um, you know, of being exposed. Uh, you know, Julian invented, or you know, the Julian and WikiLeaks invented this system uh, that was a magnet for leakers. You know, these huge data sets. Uh, and what we see now is, you know, that these sort of Uh, these things that, that have been created by a cypherpunk have been co-opted by, by the institutions that uh, Julian, you know, was fighting against. So, you know, you have the New York Times has an anonymous drop box. You have, like, Washington Post has an anonymous drop box. But, like, you can submit anonymously, but then it just goes into the same filter. Like, you know, and they, it's, it's, you know, it's really, they've sort of co-opted co the WikiLeaks model and um, turned it into their sort of part of their institutional power system that they've been running for years and years. So, yeah, um, but, yeah, but, yeah, and I think there's, they're, they're just very scared of it and, uh, yeah, I, I, you know, I, they want him dead basically. You know, that, that's the crust of it. They, they want him dead. And I'm... So... In this appeal um, on December 10th, um, the judge actually sided with um, the U.S. Um, and uh, this was at, and basically said that Julian could be extradited. Um, this is now being basically there's an appeal hearing at the Supreme Court um, in the the UK, the UK Supreme Court. Um, so what's the course of action now in terms of legal uh, recourse? 
Yeah, so the Supreme Court appeal will come up. Uh, we'll, we, so Julian's applied to the Supreme Court for uh, permission to appeal. Uh, he'll probably will probably find that out, I guess, and the appeal might be heard before the summer. Uh, and if that appeal's rejected, then you know he could potentially be extradited. Uh, he could appeal to the European Court of Human Rights, but the UK is sort of you know trying to pull back from 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 that. Um, and then there's potential for a cross appeal to the lower uh, to uh, to cross appeal to the lower court's rulings on all the substantive press freedom grounds. Uh, so that so there's potential for that court uh, for those proceedings to happen. But I, you know, in my opinion, um, I think a sort of extradition is is like very likely, highly likely uh, that he'll be extradited sooner than sooner than we think. But that the decision on 10th of December really kicked off um, when the extradition was ordered. There was this like global outrage uh, around the world that that was um, you know started. The, you know, we saw so much sort of people became really angry, and and uh, there was some a few. Then we saw like Ross Dow had just just uh, come about, and it was and everyone saw how successful that was, and they you know bought the the Ross's first NFT collection, and it was this sort of global outrage that kicked off some calls. So people on Twitter were calling, "Oh, what about a free Assange Dow? Or what about Assange Dow?" And uh, you know. Uh, one of our multi-sig signers, McKenna, posted a tweet, and then Harry Halpin, who's uh, CEO of NIM, he you know reposted a tweet saying this is a great idea. And uh, I'd been talking to Stella about DAOs, you know, a couple of months before, and you know it all just started to move so quickly after that. Everyone sort of came together uh, into a Telegram group, and yeah, that was in December 10, and now we have uh, you know now there's a thriving community of 10,000 people who are in free Assange DAO. Cool. Yeah, let's talk about um, the Assange DAO. So um, th there was um, people who could, con could contribute ETH to the Assange DAO, right? And um, uh, the, the DAO collected, I believe, 16,500 uh, 16, ETH. So that's uh, $50 million. Um, and then uh, that was spent on an NFT by PAC with um, the understanding that the money would go to a foundation, the Wow Holland Foundation. Can you tell us about the entire, um, what happened and why did it happen? Whenever the DAO was starting to form on December 10th of last year, many people were joining the Telegram group and mentioning NFTs as a way for the Assange DAO to form. And this was because Uh, December 10th was actually shortly after the success of the Free Ross DAO. So we wanted to emulate that successful use case as much as possible. So Gabriel had also joined the Telegram group around that time, and he mentioned that there was, there was indeed an NFT in the works from the Julian Assange side, but the details uh, weren't fully revealed yet as far as when that would be launched or what that would look like okay so um can you describe the the nft that was actually bought so the nft is a collaboration between assange and pak called clock and it displays in words the number of days that assange has been in belmarsh prison so basically every day the clock updates counting up the number of days And whenever he gets released, the clock will go to zero. Uh, this mechanism is also tied to an open edition of Vanguard NFTs that Puck allowed people to mint for free when the auction was underway, uh, where people can type in a, a message and it and it looks censored on the NFT, like there's a, a line um, going across it, or going across the message. But also, all of these NFTs that people are minted, they're locked in their wallets. And as soon as Julian Assange becomes free, they'll unlock and they'll become uncensored. And by becomes free, you mean leaves Belmarsh? Because those are not the same thing, right? It, you know, it's dynamic, but in multiple ways. So, um, yeah, as Julian's situation changes, I, I believe the, uh, that the clock will change. 
Um, and but if Julian work, I think one of those ones that we know about is that if Julian walks three free, you know, is released and is free, actually free, that the clock will turn to zero. So I guess it, it's a you know I think you know what's interesting about it is you've got I think twenty nine I think there was almost thirty thousand people who um, who minted one of the open edition. So they've all linked all these open editions that people have are all stuck in their wallets. They're all sort of being censored. They're all not free, right? Um, so this concept that um, you know all these people have this Julian Puck NFT, but they uh, are, are they're linked to Julian's freedom. So it's this interesting sort of interplay, I guess, with with people. And my, my, I guess one of the ideas would be that you know it motivates them to you know, advocate for Julian's freedom or do something for Julian's freedom because, uh, you know, their NFT is tied to that if they want to trade it, I guess. So the the entire um, sum that the DAO raised, um, 16,500 ETH, was bid on this NFT, right? So basically the second highest bidder um, is uh, was Jesse Powell from from Kraken. Uh, you can, he, he did it with his uh, ETH address. So basically it, it was very obvious. Why did the DAO decide, or why do you think the DAO decided to outbid him by like 11,000 ETH? Because, I mean, in principle, the DAO could have also just kept those ETH to have at their disposal, right? Yes. Yeah. So uh, this is, there was a very, there was a lot of um, debate within the DAO about, within the sort of core group about this, uh, this, you know, this strategy uh, that we used. And there was, uh, so yeah, it was a hotly debated strategy, uh, but you know this this is the sort of uh, the path that was chosen in the end. You know, we had some some in the some in the group who supported, some who didn't, and and this is the sort of uh, way we way we went in the, within the DAO structure. There is a um, you know some representatives from yeah some representatives from Julian's family, uh, and and uh, we sort of uh, we were the sort of you know, deciding vote basically between the between the the two group the two groups in the core who were uh, going either way, and so we went with uh, the tried and tested uh, Wow Holland Foundation, who um, uh, you know have been supporting Julian and his legal fees uh, for for a long time, uh, who have um, you know been resist you know resisted uh, you know these regulatory attacks before. Uh, so, so it was a, a pathway that was, um, yeah, a tested pathway to get this money to uh, where it needs to be as soon as possible. So, um, what were what were the arguments um, against that course of action? Well, I think uh, so. The arguments against were, um, you know, that the we that the Dow could. Uh, use this treasury um, and potentially, you know, uh, you know, put put it through its governance structure and create a sort of uh, a DAO model that would have been, um, you know, more sustainable. The DAO still has some treasury. There will be, I think, five percent left in the DAO for DAO operations. Uh, that would that would be the JBX. Yeah, yeah. There will be like the JBX tokens that that we we are going to uh, the DAO will apply to. Uh, get back, but yeah, I think that that was you know the the arguments were against against where well we could we have this DAO structure here you know let's let's use it and and uh, you know use the treasury and put it through the DAO structure. So that was the arguments for. Maybe let's 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 go to the future of the DAO in a second. But basically, just to kind of close this line of uh, inquiry. So basically, the 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 fifty million they kind of went to Puck with the understanding that he would, um, he, or they would, uh, uh, that, that they would give them to the Wow Holland um, Foundation. Yes, yeah, yeah. So that's the the, the pathway there, and it's a it's a, also it's a Julian collaborate. So it's a collaboration. So it's a Julian it's Julian's first NFT as well. So uh, mm -hmm. you know that's a, a good good thing to spend the money on. As, you know, if Julian feels like he's going to do other NFTs as well. Okay, and um, I'm, I mean the Wow Holland Foundation. This is a German foundation, right? So in principle, you can actually give to the Wow Holland Foundation, and everything that you give is tax deductible. 
um, wh where their thoughts of just um, having a public call to um, t to ask people to give to the Wow Holland Foundation on Julian's behalf, because obviously doing things tax free is always an additional incentive, right? Yeah, I mean, we, uh, I've been sort of trying. You know, I've been advocating. Uh, you know, in the crypto community for, um, you know, almost, uh, you know, almost two years now. And it's, uh, you know, people that this, it's very hard to uh, get people to part with their, uh, their crypto if you're just asking for a donation, you know, you have to offer, if, if they all want some value. So you can offer them, you know, uh, an NFT uh, or something like that. So I think that that was the, the catalyst and the sort of pathway, like following on from Ross Dow and seeing how successful they were, uh, that, you know, we coincide the Dow launch uh, with the NFT sale and it really just, um, you know, blows things up, you know, like it just it just makes everything uh, bigger. And I think, you know, we've seen there's been worldwide news now, like, you know, the, on the NFT sale all around the world, which I don't think would have happened otherwise. Um you know, it's been reported all over the world. Reuters put out a report and it's just picked up and it's been taken, you know, it's in Mexico, in the US, all over the place. Uh, people reporting on a positive story about uh, Julian with a different narrative, uh, you know, about how many people are supporting him, how much money he's able to raise. So getting that positive message, uh, you know, about Julian's cause and the people who are supporting him is, uh, you know, it's in like every single, most, most publications around the world is uh, you can't really buy that, you know, you can't buy that. So uh, that's yeah. one of the great things about about the, um, you know, the NFT purchase and the, and the DAO's raise. So what's going to happen with the NFT now that it belongs to the DAO? The DAO has to decide what happens with it, essentially. I understand there's no um, set course of action, but um, what are the options that the DAO is considering? Well, I believe that the main option the community is talking about is a potential fractionalization of the NFT. But for that to happen, there would have to be a proposal put through and approved by the justice token holders. And uh, justice is the token of the Assange DAO. I understand that basically for every ETH contributed, you got a million justice tokens, right? And um, in principle, they're tradable on the open market, so you can actually trade them on Uniswap or wherever you want. What are the plans um, for the holders of the justice token? So basically, what are the plans for, for the DAO in principle? What do you think is in its future? Do you think it's it's like it's it's a one time thing, which is basically it's it's a kind of a GoFundMe crossed with an NFT so as to get media attention? Um, or do you think the, the Assange DAO is going to make it into the future and kind of find um, find and uh, find a mission with um, their justice tokens kind of like um i'm, I'm sure you guys are, are familiar with constitution dao right i don't think the dao has necessarily ended right now but let me just explain a bit what gabriel was mentioning before as far as these jbx tokens so Assange DAO used Juicebox as a platform to raise its funds, but Juicebox took 5% of all the Ethereum raised, which is about 2.5 million USD worth. Uh, but what they did was give the DAO their Juicebox, aka JBX tokens, in exchange for taking this ETH. So right now, there's a proposal under review in the Juicebox DAO to upgrade their JBX ETH bonding curve from 70% to 95%, meaning that if this proposal is approved, Assange DAO will be able to exchange the JBX tokens into Juicebox's bonding curve and get back 95% of this 5% ETH fee that Juicebox took, which is still, you know, close to 2.5 million. So then this will give the Assange DAO a bit of a treasury to work with beyond uh, just the JBX tokens, which do not have that much liquidity. So that's one of the steps that needs to be taken. And then the other major step, though, is really formalizing the governance processes and governance model of the DAO. 
So the justice holders need to vote in uh, and approve the DAO's governance model and also formulate potential governance models. So that has not happened yet. Uh, Assange DAO is going to open up a snapshot space and start to enable justice governance, though. So those are the next steps, basically solidifying the governance model, but at the same time, the DAO's mission. You know, there are very clear constraints on the website as far as what Assange DAO's primary focus should be, essentially freeing and liberating Assange. But right now there are, you know, many people joining the community and sometimes they, you know, bring up software ideas or becoming a more generic DAO for justice. But it is called Assange DAO. So I believe that it's important, um, you know, I, I believe it's personally important for the mission to be highly specific to Julian Assange, you know, in my opinion. But essentially justice holders need to, vote in and approve on, like, make sure that everyone is aligned with a common mission. Are there considerations of kind of becoming a decentralized freedom of the press foundation or decentralized WikiLeaks? So there are definitely many people in the community that have brought up that idea or want that to be a focus of Assange DAO. I personally don't think it makes sense as far as that being a project that Assange DAO incubates. But I do believe in general that it is a worthy idea to fund, but it's better off being funded by creating a more focused free software DAO. But, you know, that's my opinion. Other than kind of fund Julian Assange's um, legal uh, costs, which is which I understand um, should be more or less taken care of with um, the the money that's that's going to Wow Holland. So I mean, I uh, fortunately I have never had to face trial anywhere, partic in particularly in the US. But I mean, I can't imagine that. Um, I mean, even um, that. I mean, the legal proceedings are going to be more than like fifteen or twenty million, right? I mean, that should be ample money for the defense, right? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, yeah, I, I guess if you look at like some of the strat for some of the strat for emails, you, and 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 it says, uh, you know, move him from move him from um, place to place, and and have him involved in endless, uh, you know, legal cases for the next thirty years. So if you divide that amount by thirty years of legal, uh, it's it's you know, it doesn't really at the end of that, it's not you're not left with that much. You know, if you're talking about um, you know, going to the Supreme Court in the US or or other places like that, it's very very costly. And uh, in the in the US as well, you'll have to run a we will have to run a dual campaign like lobbying uh, and all that sort of stuff because this is a political case, right? It's not uh, the courts uh, provide this veil uh, of legality uh, for people so that so that so, so that it allows allows a whole section of society to switch off and and say, oh well, the court's doing their job. You know, he'll be. He'll get the benefit of justice. His rights are okay, but um, really, it's uh, just another arm of the state. So uh, it's really a political case and has to be won uh, politically as well. But uh, you still need the best lawyers because if they make a mistake, then um, you know you can't really wind it back. So you know, in terms of uh, is it is it enough funds? I think you know we could easily uh, spend more than that on a case like this. This is very much a political case, right? So basically winning it in the arena of uh, public relations is probably the way to go. I would assume as someone who wants to be reelected, you make sure um, a widely unpopular case is dropped um, against if it's seen like a, a big injustice. So basically what what are the plans for um, Assange DAO for, from the people within the DAO who, who, want, who want it to stay um, centered on Assange as a person? Well, the DAO is still in a nascent phase, so there is not necessarily any clear or strategic plans that have been fully formulated yet. The current phase is really about seeing what emerges from the community, and then the DAO can start acting on ideas after it has a treasury of ETH that it will get back from Juicebox. What we achieved so far, like what the DAO has achieved so far, has been 
you know, uh, absolutely. Like it's it's history. You know, like I think. Correct me if I'm wrong, Elder. We, I mean, Stella, we started forming it like two, three weeks ago, right? Like, like literally, it, we were sort of in a holding pattern. The group, the Dow group, was in a holding pattern, and then, you know, we had the NFT auction date, and then we everyone just like dropped everything, and literally, I think most of us haven't slept for three weeks. Um, and and this is the sort of where we're all still sort of coming down now. I don't know. I think I've aged like two years or something in three weeks. <laughs> yeah, basically as soon as the date uh, of the Pack and Assange NFT auction was announced, there was not that much time and there's so much to do and it was so very, very intense for sure. Yeah, I can imagine that it must have been a mad scramble. So do, do I understand this correctly that, um, Gabriel, um, you and the rest of the family kind of brought Pack to the table? Yeah, Julian was thinking about an NFT after, you know, obviously uh, Snowden had a wildly successful NFT. Uh, you know, all the proceeds of that went to the Freedom of the Press Foundation, uh, which he's the chairman of. Uh, and it was, you know, wildly successful. And after that, we started... Uh, you know, Julian started thinking about an NFT, you know, who would be good to collaborate with. And uh, that's when we, you know, looked at, looked at a range of, looked at a range of artists and, um, yeah, spoke to Pac and he was, or should they were, um, you know, they had some ideas and that, you know, it sort of just went from there. And that was, I think we, that was back in May. So there was, there's been a lot of, schedule wrangling like Julian is obviously going through court proceedings and uh, Puck has a sort of schedule of releases so uh, we s yeah, eventually settled on the 7th of 7th of February yeah super super interesting um so where can people come to kind of find out more about Assange Dow and also probably shape the future of the organization right so you can learn more by going to the Assange Dao website, uh, assangedao.org. Um, the forum is the best place right now to participate in discussions, and that is at forum.assangedao.org. And that's basically where the future of the governance will be formed and where people can submit proposals for discussion. And you can also follow Assange Dao on Twitter, with the at Assange Dow. And uh, oh, yeah, on the website, there's also uh, a link to the Substack blog as well. Cool. Gabriel, have you spoken to your brother since all of this has gone down? Uh, I haven't spoken to him directly. I spoke to his fiancee, Stella, and um, yeah, he's very, very moved. Um, you know, it's there's not much good news uh, for Julian. Um, you know, over these past years. So uh, this sort of thing really makes a difference uh, to his mood and, and lifts it lifts everyone around the world. It really lifts every single support network, whether they're street activists, whether they're, uh, you know, podcasters who are on side, whether they're, you know, at the 10,000 strong community that are in the Dow. Like, you know, this has been a super successful uh, initiative, um, you know, raised more than anyone else ever, uh, and so I think everyone around the world, all the supporters, all the activists are sort of lifted by this. They can see, uh, you know, the tide is changing and, and, and I think that's what we're feeling. And, uh, I think that's what Julian feels. If people want to get involved in a non-DAO way, what are the best ways to contribute? Uh, you, there's, there's, depending where you are, there's a few different websites that don't extradite, uh, Assange or is, is um, the big one in the UK. Um, AssangeDefense.org is in the US. Um, but yeah, you know, get on, there's like Facebook groups, Twitter, Twitter groups that are all the different um, activists around the world. There's like, there's so many activist groups um, that, that there literally is anywhere you go, there is an Assange uh, support activist group. So yeah, get, get involved with them. Um, I, I think, one of the main things is talking to your neighbours, talking to your friends about it. Uh, you know, if you're a, if you're updating them and, and getting them to support the case and telling them the real story about what's going on, uh, and not what it's not like what they read in the media or what they're exposed to, you know, on the television or whatever. Um, 
yeah, so give them the give them the actual news. How, how much value is then reaching out to your political representatives? Because it is at its core a political case, right? Yeah, and I, yes, so that 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 works as well. Uh, that's that's very successful. If you, um, you know, uh, like I in my in my lecture at home, I if I, I I see the MP on the street, I go up to him and go, "Hey, what are you doing? You know, what are you doing about Assange? Like, you know, you got to do something." I think that's, you know, if you're confronting them on the street, they can't hide they can't hide from you. So I think that's one really good way. Uh, Localized petitions uh, are really good. So if you're you know, in your local area and you have a representative, uh, get together people and do a localised petition, submit them to uh, your representative. Um, there are groups of, of parliamentarians in most, like France has a group of 49 uh, parliamentarians who support Assange. Uh, Britain has 26. Australia has a group of 28. Uh, in Greece, there's 100, a third of the parliament uh, is in a Assange support group. So, Encouraging uh, parliamentarians to join these groups uh, is is a very important part as well, and something that every normal person can do because they need um, our votes. Cool. Thank you both for coming on. This was uh, super interesting. Thanks.